var. Good morning all. Um, thanks for joining the MLA Sheep webinar. We will just give everyone a minute uh, just while everyone else jumps on. So we will kick off in one minute at one past 11. So with a minute past 11 striking over, we will kick off. Um, people will join throughout the webinar. Um, welcome to MLA's first Sheep Projections webinar of 2023. Today, we're going to be walking through the Sheep Projections document that was released on Tuesday. And um, we'd like to start by thanking everyone for giving us the time to, to take us through this content today. My name's Steve Bignall, and today I'll be the moderator of the Sheep Projections webinar. I'm the uh, Market Information and National Livestock Reporting Service Manager at MLA, who looks after all the production, supply and pricing insights, as well as market reports in the slaughter report. The team who will be taking you through the projections, uh, February release of the projections webinar today will be Ripley Atkinson, the MLA's Senior Market Information Analyst, Jenny Lim, MLA's Market Information Analyst, and Tim Jackson, MLA's Business Analyst, who looks after exports. So I will now um, hand over to the team to do a bio of themselves, starting with you, Rip. Good morning, everyone. I'm the Senior Market Information Analyst for Meat and Livestock Australia. I'm from Tamworth in northwest New South Wales, and my role entails uh, the management and delivery of the sheep and cattle projections, and then also the quarterly lot feeding brief, and working alongside Jenny uh, with the delivery of the State of the Industry Report later in the year. And then on top of that, general day-to-day -day analysis around the pricing and production supply side of the, of the red meat and livestock industry. Thanks, Rip. Uh, we'll now go over to Jen. Hi, everyone. Yeah, um, my name is Jenny Lim, Market Information Analyst, originally from the Southwest, West Australia. Um, I actually have a, a background in agronomy, six years in the cropping industry um, before this, um, and I deal a lot with the sheep side of things. So the sheep producer intention survey, um, I manage that. I manage um, co-products as well, and then um, any kind of commentary around the industry um, and, and work alongside Rip to produce those. Thanks, that, Jenny. And we'll close out with yourself, Tim. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, my name's Tim Jackson. I'm the uh, business analyst for the market information team at MLA, um, and I handle uh, all of our export market reporting. So that's export volumes, but also price, um, and contribute commentary and analysis to the various pieces that we discussed earlier. Um, and, and also, I uh, look at overseas supply and what's happening in you know, the global flock and what's happening in the international market and how that can affect price here and how uh, our production and our exports interact with that global market. Thanks for that, Tim, and, and the team. So the team's contact details will be provided in the chat function today, and they are obviously um, underneath the slide today. So please reach out to us if you do have any supplier production or pricing insights for, for cattle, sheep and, and goats. So before we move into the sort of substantive part of the webinar today, I'll just go over a few housekeeping points. The first is uh, that all participants will be on mute throughout the presentation. The second housekeeping point is regard in regards to questions. So there will be 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the presentation today that will be allocated to question uh, to questions and question time. Feel free to add your question um, into the Q and A function, which is in the top right of your screen today as we go along at any time throughout the presentation. If you enter a question during the presentation, we won't answer it then, but we will get to it at the uh, end of the of the question time. Um, with regards to questions, we, we endeavour to get to all questions today, um, but time permitting, we might not be able to. And if we can't get to your question today in the allocated time, we will take your questions on notice and we will uh, get back to you and endeavour to re respond in a very prompt manner. The other, the third point, 
regarding housekeeping is is regarding the recording of today's webinar. So today's webinar is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be uploaded to both YouTube and MLA's, uh, MLA's uh, website today. So that is regarding the, the recording. It'll also be sent to participants of today's webinar on, on request. The fourth housekeeping point is regarding uh, the projections document itself. So the projections, the substantive um, multi-page document was released on Tuesday under the trends and analysis um, section of MLA's website, and it will be circulated tomorrow in MLA's weekly EDM uh, newsletter, The Weekly. And uh, the last point of housekeeping is that there will be a survey at the end of the webinar if you you will be prompted to fill this out and, and we really encourage you to fill that survey out because it does help us to continually improve the products that we deliver and, and to ensure that what we are delivering as a market information team meets your needs and as our stakeholders so with all the housekeeping covered and the bios done, we will launch into the content for today's discussion. The, what we are going to cover today is the assumptions which cover the macro and, and issues and weather. We'll then look at the key takeaways at a high level. We'll look at the national flock, slaughter of both lamb and sheep, carcass rates and production, live exports, and then we'll finish with, with the global um, competitors and what's happening there. So with that, um, said, I'll now jump on into the questions of today's webinar. So Jen, I'll start with you. You've identified the importance of recent weather patterns and negative, the in negative Indian Ocean diapole supporting the growth in the flock. How has the weather outlook impacted these projections? Thanks, Steve. So um, the BOM have predicted a negative IOD in the next 12 months um, and that means that there'll be less rain in the southern sections of Australia and this is where majority of our sheep producing regions are. Um, and El Nino is forecast to hit for um, the next six to 12 in the next six to 12 months and this further um, backs this up that there'll be less rain in those southern sections um, forecast. So in the last 12 to 24 months, we've actually seen um, really favourable conditions, which many people are aware of. Um, and this has supported an abundance of feed on ground and record grain harvests, which has allowed a really intense rebuild um, period that we've seen over that time. Um, temperatures are also set to be above average um, going into joining, and this is especially in west, the southwest of Western Australia, South Australia and Tasmania, which are um, some sheep producing um, regions. Uh, New South Wales is expected to have average conditions or even below average conditions um, moving into the next few months, so um, this could aid joining. Um, you know, weather is a massive underpinner of um, decision making and, and um, how much feed is on ground, and because a lot of sheep um, producers are also grain producers and mixed system. Um, weather really plays into how much crop they plant and how much, um, how many sheep they um, graze. Thanks for that, Jen. So we've covered weather there. I'll follow up with you and, and we'll move into sort of the macro issues. So not just weather, but the macro issues that are industry are really dealing with at present. And, and could you elaborate on these? So when we went out to industry um, consultation, we asked them what key issues they're expecting in the next 12 months and labour was one of the greatest um, constraints that they were identifying, especially in the processing sector and earlier in the supply chain, um, such as shearing. So um, the sheep producer intention survey indicated that 65% um, of producers actually believe that access to labour will continue to be difficult over the next 12 months. And this is especially in that shearing um, shearing part of the supply chain. Um, so in the 2021 census, it actually showed that six, there was a 16% decrease in the number of shearers available in Australia um, when compared to the 2016 census. And this is due to a number of things. Um, we're competing with New Zealand in terms of labour availability um, and where we get our shearers from. So there have been some government schemes introduced, such as PALM, and this could help ease the issue around shearers and processing staff. Um, but it has to be noted that there's um, some time lag uh, between training um, of this staff and visa approvals um, for these uh, these programs. So um, we could see some easing in labor um, labor shortages, but um, it's still been identified as a key um, bottleneck. The other things that were identified was the cost of production and input prices. 
So um, things in the processing sector, such as the cost of packaging and waste removal have been highlighted by the industry. Um, other things such as electricity costs. So the RBA has um, forecast that electricity will rise by 20 to 30% in 2023. And this is considered um, conservative by industry participants. Um, fuel costs have also increased 7.9% at the end of last year when compared to 2021 prices. So big input costs um, also have increased. So grain and fertilizer prices have been pushing up the cost of um, numbers on uh, putting lands on feed, but also um, in sheep for sheep producers, grain pr prices increasing um, could uh, push producers to produce more grain. So um, we're seeing an allocation of land um, shift in some in some cases. Um, but fertilizer prices have been extremely high and above average prices from from the last year or so. Thanks for that, Jen. That's a great up, uh, update on on sort of the macro issues and the and the weather. So that gives us the context of where we the environment we're operating in. I'll go to you, Rip, and, and keen to understand at a, at a first glance the top takeaway figures from this projections uh, release. Thanks, Steve. So with the first figure, seventy eight point seventy five million. That'll be the highest the flock size has been since 2007. And as a result of that, there's three factors, as a result of that growth, there's three underpinning factors to what we're, we're seeing in the improvement. Firstly, it's that medium term confidence at the farm gate level for producers. And that's really based on those favorable seasonal or favorable su successive seasonal conditions, um, really driving improvement in overall availability of grass, grain and water. And what that's then doing for the production of, of breeding ewes, we know a lot of ewe lambs were joined uh, early in the rebuild to then improve productivity and, and improve the, or capitalize on those good seasons to lift, uh, lift the rebuild faster and improve um, its pace. But on top of that, there's also the investment producers have made in genetics, and that's had a really significant improvement or underpinned improvement in productivity capability of these breeding females. The weather conditions alongside that have supported above average branding and marking rates for, for lands, and that's delivering a larger land cohort. And finally, as a result of all of those factors growing the flock, we've also seen then the ability for, for those larger land cohorts to allow producers to turn off uh, more non-productive stock or non-productive use as well. And that's also then having a flow on effect to to topics such as sheep slaughter, which I'll, I'll discuss later. Looking at lamb slaughter, as I mentioned, the larger lamb cohorts will see lamb slaughter reach the fourth highest uh, volume on record this year. And as a result of historically elevated carcass weights, we're expecting record lamb production in 2023 at 569,000 tonnes. As I just mentioned, the uh, affordability of producers now being able to turn off uh, non-performing or cast rage ewes, that'll see sheep slaughter lift substantially by 24% this year to 7.6 million head. Thanks for that high level overview, Rip, and, and looks really encouraging for the industry, I suppose. Having looked at those top level figures, can we now move out and have a look at what the, is happening in the flock out to 2025? And also just put it into perspective around where the flock sits in our projections compared to longer term averages and, and history. Yeah, so firstly, uh, with the flock this year forecast to reach 78.75 million, that will be sitting uh, around 13% above the 10 year average, which is a, at around 70.9 million heads. So already we're seeing improvements above longer term average performance in the flock size this year. So yes, in, in recent history, it will be elevated, but when you look back between the 1980s and, and early 2000s, the flock was significantly higher than, than the forecast we're expecting this year. So it's by no means reaching records over the next three year outlook, but what it does mean is it will be uh, in, in the more recent term, uh, as, as a longer term average sense, above, above long term averages. In 2024, the flock reaching 79.5 million will be 14% or 9.8 million head above the 10 year average as well. So that's when the flock will reach its um, peak in this, in this cycle at 79.5 million. But in 2025, we're forecasting it to fall to 2023 levels at 78.5 million head. So we are expecting a decline in the flock in the flock size out to 2025 and seasonal conditions are 
returning to average or below average will contribute to that that situation. But in the, in the short term, or certainly for 2023 and 2024, we're not expecting seasonal conditions to have a really substantive impact on uh, on the performance of the flock. And now um, the expectation is that these numbers will continue to grow to the end of next year before declining in 2025. Thanks for that, Rip. So that's a really, really positive picture for, for where the flock is going. I suppose moving on, I'm, I'm keen to know um, what producer confidence and intentions are telling us and, and how they're driving this flock growth. I know Jenny, yourself and our colleagues at AWI really rebuilt the um, sheep producer intention survey. So what are the results in that new survey showing us and how do they support the flock growth? So this is the latest data we've got from the Sheep Producer Intention Survey from October last year, and we're really looking forwards to the, the new set of data coming out within the next month to six weeks. This survey um, is conducted over 2,000 sheep, meat and sheep and wool producers across Australia, and it really does align and, and support our forecast in terms of flock growth, uh, medium term confidence at the farm gate level, things like that. So I'll begin with with, with the question we asked to producers around their intention to increase their flock size over the next 12 months. 46% of Australian producers or sheep producers are expecting to increase their flock size over the next 12 months. That's clearly aligning with, with our expectation for flock growth. And that does indicate that that widespread confidence as well is underpinning those producers intending to increase numbers. The second factor is we conduct a net, uh, net sentiment aspect to that as well. And 67%, so nearly 70% of sheep meat or sheep and wool producers in the country are expected to feel very positive or positive around the next 12 months of operating conditions at the farm gate level. That optimism really does underpin the improvements we're expecting to see in flock size. And then as a result of that, also slaughter rates, production, et cetera. And when you actually delve into the data a little deeper, Looking at the uh, the net sentiment positivity, particularly in states such as Queensland, South Australia, Tassie and WA, which we've identified as being the leaders in flock growth for this year, New South Wales and Victoria as the major players will contribute, but not as significantly as those other states. And, and the sheep producer intentions data does demonstrate that that positivity in, in growing numbers is um, is more aligned with, with, with the other states, not the two main players. So all of this data combining really does underpin and align with, with our modelled model numbers. And we're really excited to, to continue to utilise and leverage what this survey can offer um, and, and see how that aligns with our figures. But certainly to, to wrap it all up, it does, um, does align with, with our forecasts and, and we're, we're very comfortable with those. Thanks for that and, and giving us some insight into those results of the new, new survey. So we've covered off on the, the flock and the producer intentions. What does that mean when we go and look towards lamb slaughter rip? Yeah, so as I mentioned uh, with those top line figures, that improved productivity through the investment producers have made in genetics and, and that continual trend towards joining new lambs is really delivering that increase in, in, the, in the lamb cohort. And we're expecting that to continue this year with larger lamb cohorts being made available to market. Um, the sheep producer intention survey also demonstrated that 46% of the, um, of the lamb cohort from last year is expected to be sold in the first six months of this year because of wet weather affecting weight gain and, and finish performance. So they'll be held back from market um, until and to be sold between now and now and June. So what that's telling us is, and alongside the modelled numbers, is we're expecting lamb slaughter to reach 22.6 million this year. That's around a 600,000 head increase or 3% on, on the 2022 estimates we had of 22 million head. So that figure there um, will be the 22.6 million will be the fourth highest on record. And then looking further ahead to 2024 at 23.2 million, that will be the live, highest lamb slaughter volume on record. So uh, that's a substantial increase from, from where we were uh, also this year. And that growth is underpinned by that expectation of larger lamb cohorts being made available to market. So the 2024 
forecast of 23.2 million, it'll be 1.1 million head or 5% higher than the 10 year average. So we're really moving into territory over the next three year outlook that, that is right at the top production level performance. And then further ahead to 2025, Land slaughter is expected to fall to 22.9 million in line with the decline in the flock size. And what that will also show, even though it's declining to 22.9 million out to 2025, that figure will still be the third highest land slaughter rate on record behind 2016 and 2024 respectively. So the outlook for land slaughter is really, really positive. And Jenny later on will discuss what these slaughter volumes then mean for production alongside that investment producers have made in, in um, genetics and how that underpins improved carcass weights and, and, and the flow on effects from those as well, Steve. Thanks for that, Rick. That's really comprehensive. And again, it's, it's an, a further positive sentiment for, for where the industry is placed and where it's going. So with that, you've covered off on lamb slaughter. I suppose the next question is, what does slaughter look like for sheep over the next three years? When you look uh, at, our, at our outlook currently and the growth in sheep slaughter, um, considering the previous two years, 2021 and 2022, how relatively low they've been, it's not uncommon to see this improvement in sheep slaughter rates. You look at the years 2010 to 2012 and then out to 2013, and again between 2016, 17 and 2018, 19, we know sheep slaughter rates can lift substantially um, in those years following wet seasonal conditions very, very quickly. So in 2023, as I mentioned, we're expecting a 24% or one and a half million head increase in sheep slaughter to 7.6 million head. And then out to 2024, 8.46 million uh, forecast to go through the processing plants. And that figure of eight and a half million head would be 6% or 500,000 head higher than the 10 year average. And what that then tells us as well, alongside lambs, is the improvement in sheep slaughter is then reaching those um, top levels of, of production of production or slaughter performance as well. So we're then reaching that that peak production period in the cycle of how the flock um, liquidates and rebuilds and grows, and that in 2024 is expected to occur. Out to 2025, sheep slaughter at 9.48 million head would be the highest since 2014. And it'd also be 20% or one and a half million head higher than the 10 year average. So as that um, maturity continues over the next three years, that nine and a half million head of sheep processed for that year will be the highest since 2014. And it really does show that in line with the flock growth, we're gonna see that continued turn off of sheep um, remain for the next three years. And as I probably wanna point out, we're expecting small stock producers this year to continue the trend they delivered in 2022, which was they had the capacity and the ability to increase production or, or slaughter volumes in line with high supply. That it was it was clearly evident that, that as that slaughter rate continued to increase and maintain those higher levels over the last couple of years in, in the back end of 2022, they had that capacity to do so and they managed to do it easier than, than the cattle industry. So we're expecting that trend to continue and we're also expecting producers to capitalise on that luxury of turning off older cast for age females and, and non-performing ewes or animals in their flock because they've got the ability to then select other animals as they've, they've already rebuilt and, and grown their flock sizes. So all of that all of those factors are really aligning to, to underpin a very positive outlook in terms of, of sheep slaughter rates for the next three years. Yeah, that's a very encouraging um, picture for, and, and it makes a lot of sense you taking us through that and, and replicating sort of those other periods of rebuild we've seen in, in terms of the sheep slaughter. Covering off slaughter there, Rip, we will we'll now move to, to Jen and, and sort of look at um, productions, obviously, slaughter and carcass weight. So we'll move across to you and see what's happening in the lamb space, both for carcass weights and from a production perspective. Yeah, so um, as previously stated, confidence in the industry has been really high, 67% net positive sentiment. Um, and this is despite the headwinds that I discussed before, such as input costs and labour costs, um, you know, and, and leading to a higher flock retention from producers. Um, so the highest slaughter rate that Rick just discussed um, 
you know, and continued genetic improvement, um, which has been uh, allowing carcass weights to remain at higher levels, um, has allowed for production to increase. So we've been we've been able to get carcass weights to record heights, and these weights are expected to continue moving into 2023. And um, 2023 carcass weights will be 11 percent higher than the 10 year average. So out to 2024 and 2025, these weights will decline only slightly to 24.9 kilograms and 24.6 kilograms. And this is just due to the seasonal conditions moving forward that I mentioned in the weather section. Um, so land production is expected to reach a new record in 2023. And this is just from the high carcass weights and the slaughter rates that we've um, discussed. Um, and these figures will only continue to grow to 577,000 and 585,000 tonnes in 2025. So production will stay strong after the huge flock increase that we've seen in the last three years and, and you know, lambs being born, higher drops um, and, and these lambs coming to weight now um, to, to be processed. Um, although genetic improvement has been a big part of it, um, you know, there's also been a slight shift to more DORPA, um, dual purpose, um, you know, meat breeds that do um, allow uh, a higher weight to be carried. So um, even though merinos hold 70% of the flock, um, we have seen some shift to these um, meat breeds which can um, come to weight, you know, and hold these weights and, and maintain the weights over a long period of time. Thanks for that, Jen. So that's again encouraging building on those record land production levels. Um, that we've seen this year and, and moving forward. I suppose, again, the question is, that's the lamb scenario. So what is production and carcass rates doing from a sheep and mutton perspective? Thanks, Steve. So much like the lamb, similar story. Um, we're seeing increased slaughter and we're seeing um, carcass weights, um, you know, being stable and maintaining um, above 25 kilograms. Um, so in 2024, weights will soften only slightly to 25.3 kilograms and then to 25 kilograms in 2025. And this is again down to those seasonal conditions that I discussed in the lambs. Um, so even with the slight softening of carcass weights, the strengthening in slaughter and, you know, the increase of those older ewes and non-performing animals being turned off will support this lift in production that we're seeing. So um, sheep production is expected to increase to 193,000 tonnes. And this is um, a 25% increase on 2022 levels. Um, these increases will continue out to 2025, um, where we hit 237,000 tonnes. Um, these production figures between sheep and lambs will help support the strong export volumes, which Tim will speak on in a bit. Um, and it's looking really positive for the industry moving forward. Thanks, Jen. So that's really positive. We've covered the flock slaughter and production, which are all showing growth growth um, phases. I suppose to close out the domestic beat and then to sort of cap, uh, to move towards exports is, Rip, I'll move to you and get a bit of a background on what's happening in the live export space, just to close out that before we move to Tim for, for exports and, and competitors. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So I think the important thing also is to recognise that there are challenges for, for Australia's live export industry for sheep and there have been some challenges that are overhanging uh, the sector or that they're, they're, they're shadowing the sector uh, last year and, and they've been around for some time and that's both on a domestic and, and international front. Looking domestically, the the phase out or the ban by the Labor government um, expected or, or not in the first term of government but, but that um, voicing by the Labor government to phase out or ban live sheep exports has clearly affected the capacity of Australia's live export industry, its live exporters and its and its live export focused producers to, to be able to deliver those volumes of uh, of sheep to, to the Middle East and North African markets, which are our which are our main live export markets for sheep. Furthermore, from that, there has been the last two years in Western Australia, which really does dominate live export volumes of rebuilding flock numbers following the drought. So that's also contributed to a contraction in supply and availability of stock as those producers look to, you know, to rebuild numbers, retain animals and, and capitalise on those favourable conditions. So that overhanging uh, phase out or ban of the live export industry coupled with the with the contraction of availability of stock has has hindered that situation domestically. When you look at the global front, the removal of, by the Qatar government of subsidies 
supporting the imports of Australian live sheep for, for those consumers has also then affected the demand in Qatar, which prior to the removal of those subsidies was a very major market and a, and a major destination for Australian sheep exports. So there's that factor there as well. And then we, when we look to the actual dynamics and the forecast for 2023, we know uh, Western Australia, along with, with other states, is forecast to really grow its flock this year. So supply is going to be made available to market to meet those live exports, live exports specifications for uh, for the exporters and producers then aligning aligning with with that part of the supply chain. So the demand is forecast to be there. And what that means is we're expecting volumes to remain firm in terms of, of export volumes at 500,000 head this year before increasing to 540,000 head in 2024 and 580,000 head in 2025. So there is upside in our forecast for growth and we know the supply of Western Australian sheep will be there to, to meet that demand from international markets. When you look in the international space, the Middle East North African nations do do need like the rest of the world a protein uh, that they, they're in a protein deficit and they have a very high expectation and and they do feel strongly about the quality of Australian live export sheep that enter that market to meet their cultural and um, ethical beliefs. So there is that demand. And when you look at the growth in in terms of protein consumption in market in Middle East North Africa, it is there, which is which is clearly indicating that the demand will be there. It's whether our, our industry can cope with the current and, and overcome these current challenges it's, it's experiencing on a domestic front to capitalise and deliver that really high quality product that we know millions of people in those parts of the world, world want from us, Steve. Thanks for that, Rip. And, and that closes out largely a lot of the domestic stuff that we're, we're thinking about. And, and it makes, a, like I said, a good segue to go out to Tim around looking at some of our competitors and looking at the supply environments that some of our major competitors, New Zealand and the UK, are f focusing on. So, Tim, New Zealand is our key competitor in the sheep meat export space. Can you explain the dynamics that are going on with their flock and then what that might mean for Australia? Right. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, so, like you said, New Zealand's our primary competitor on the global market for sheep meat, and they've got a very strong share in key markets like China, the United Kingdom and the European Union. Um, the Kiwi sheep flock structurally has been in decline for decades, and that's partially due to um, changes in land use, you know, around a growing population, but also the growth of the uh, New Zealand dairy cattle herd has put pressure on flock numbers. Um, Despite this, exports have been fairly steady over that period, or they've grown slightly in the last decade. And that's because domestic consumption has fallen substantially, down by over 85% since the turn of the millennium to about 2.2 kilograms per person, um, according to the OECD. So the spring 2022 lamb crop was down about 2.6% from 2021, and exports are forecast to stay flat at best, according to uh, Beef and Lamb New Zealand. So that means that New Zealand's uh, sheep meat production is unlikely to grow substantially over the next few years. And there's no extra capacity for, you know, extra exports coming out of their uh, domestic supply. And at the same time, what we know is that demand is growing globally for sheep meat. Um, and so given that our primary competitor is likely to have fairly flat volumes, that means that demand's going to grow overall, which means that there's an opportunity for Australia to grow market share um, over the next few years and take advantage of quite strong prices, which we're likely to see in the international market. Thanks, Tim. So that's following off what's happening in New Zealand, I suppose. The other major export competitor that we have or, or player in that sheep meat export and import space is the UK. It's the third largest sheep meat exporter um, globally. We've got an FTA that's coming into effect this year, and, and we've seen you talk about declining export volumes from the uh, New Zealand, so one of our key competitors. What does that all mean for uh, the Australian Australian sheep meat industry in that space? Yes. So. The UK is a really, really interesting participant in the global market because it's fully integrated. So it's a big exporter and it's also um, a, a very large importer. And the way that essentially works is there's a value optimization thing that they're doing. So they're exporting lots of chilled meat out to the European Union and they tend to import um, quite a bit of meat 
uh, quite a bit of sheep meat, lamb in particular, to kind of smooth out changes in seasonal production. Um, now, what's happened over the last few years is that the growth of the market for imported sheep meat into China um, has meant that a lot of, uh, you know, exported sheep meat has started going there, particularly from New Zealand. And what we can see is that the price premium that you get for exporting meat to uh, uh, the UK compared to China has been steadily declining over that period. So New Zealand exporters are increasingly exporting into China, which is creating a bit of a gap in supply in the United Kingdom. Um, now, in the short term, production in the UK is forecast to rise slightly, but because they are integrated into the global market in the way I described earlier, most of that additional production is likely to be exported. Um, so exports are forecast to rise by about 15% year on year over the next year, um, according to uh, the uh, UK's um, agriculture board. And so that presents then an opportunity for Australia, because even as production is going up a little bit, there's still that seasonal variation in supply. Um, and over the next year or so, we're expecting to get substantially better market access into the UK than we've had for at least 40 years. Um, and as we had those dips in supply and as uh, New Zealand exporters are increasingly uh, shifting out to exporting into China, um, that creates an opportunity for us. In the longer term, that opportunity is likely to grow more because high inflation across the UK is increasing input prices for producers and the removal of producer subsidies will likely affect production volumes kind of structurally over the next few years. So the UK is a very exciting opportunity for Australian exporters um, and that's an opportunity that's likely to grow over time. Thanks, Tim. And, and I suppose that is thanks to the team. I suppose that brings to the close just the questions that I had. And I appreciate Tim, Rip and Jen for answering all of my questions and the insights you've provided on the significant value of the sheep meat sector the, um, now and going forward. This is where we will now open up uh, questions for the next 15 minutes to uh, those on the call. There's already a few in the Q&A um, tab. So I'll go to the one, um, and this is probably a question for you, Tim, from Anonymous. Will we continue to see a gain in market share in the US? What fate factors will influence this the most? And I suppose there's a few things, one against our competitors into the US, but also I think the US domestic supply piece has been explored a bit recently with, with how the drought is impacting their domestic um, supply space. So can you answer that, Tim? Sure. Um, and just before we start on this, we don't uh, project out, you know, export volumes to specific markets. Um, that's probably impossible to actually do. Uh, but in very broad terms, if we look at it structurally, uh, the American uh, flock has been declining uh, for several decades now, and their sheep meat production has been declining for uh, a similar period of time. Um, we, like Australian uh, exports, make up in a given year between about 55 and 65 percent of American uh, domestic supply of sheep meat. Um, so we have a very large market share in the United States um, and it's probably a little bit less of a question of market share itself and how big that market is because sheep meat is very much a niche protein in the United States um, and what we've seen over the past few years is that uh, demand has been increasing. We've been able to export more, we've been able to premiumize in that market um, and so as that's occurring given that we do have such a strong market share already um, the United States is a really really strong market for us because it's you know quite large very premium. Um, and as it's continuing to grow, that means like in absolute volume terms, we can imagine that our export volumes to the US would continue to grow as well. Um, and also our main competitor in the US is New Zealand. And as I discussed earlier, um, it, it's somewhat unlikely that their production will grow or their export volumes will grow substantially in the medium term. Um, so we're really, really well set up in the United States and we're op very optimistic about that market. Thanks for that, Tim. And it might be another question for you, but Rip, I think you might also have some 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 points on this. Is what's happening on the demand side? So we've seen record production. It's coming from Peter. Record production. What's happened on the demand side of things? Uh, noting that we obviously came out of record production last year, we were able to find a place for all of that meat domestically or export. So keen to get your thoughts on on what sort of the demand side, the demand side. Um, of the equation with this record production that we're seeing. 
Um, so because, you know, we are an export oriented uh, sort of industry and we're exporting quite a lot of lamb and mutton around the world, um, what we can generally observe is that there kind of gets to a point where people have enough income at a household level that they're able to afford to participate in the kind of imported meat space. So generally speaking, if you're making over as a household 45,000 US dollars a year, that's kind of the trigger where your protein consumption starts to go up a lot. Um, and that has driven that increase in household incomes globally. Uh, it looks like that's driven a lot of the increase in uh, demand um, for, you know, sheep meat in the global market. Um, now, what we can reasonably expect from that is that the number of people kind of in that category of what we might think of as a global middle class um, is likely to continue to increase uh, over the next few years, um, potentially slightly slower than we saw in the 2010s, um, because it seems that the very, very rapid growth out of China um, is likely to slow down somewhat. But we already have a much larger uh, market of people for our product around the world um, and lots of other markets, which previously we might have thought of as a little bit smaller, but continuing to develop. So say we're seeing increasing uh, lamb volumes into Papua New Guinea, which is really exciting. Um, and so, yeah, so the demand side of the equation is very positive because uh, at, at a fundamental level, production globally is growing slightly or staying flat, and that's been true for quite a while. Um, demand is growing um, around the world. And because we're, you know, well established as a participant in the global market, uh, we'll be well able to meet a lot of those uh, needs. So, yeah, so the demand side is looking really positive. Um, do you have anything on that, Rip? Not necessarily, Tim. I think the important thing, which Tim's also mentioned, is the diversity of markets we send our product to. We're not over leveraged or over capitalized to any individual market. We send red meat to over 100 countries around the world. And because we have that diversity in, in you know, the markets we send our product to, it means there's always going to be a consumer there somewhere that needs our product. We know the world is in a protein shortage. We know we deliver some of the highest quality red meat product and, and lamb and mutton for that matter around the world. So when you look at the export volumes, how 2022 performed, yes, there was some really strong performance in what we recognise as established markets, but the emerging markets such as Papua New Guinea, um, you know, Canada, South Korea, those other markets which you wouldn't traditionally consider, you know, lamb, lamb staples in a household, the growth there does demonstrate that they want our product. And, and it may not be those established markets, but, but the increase, you know, even Malaysia and Vietnam, for example, improvements in mutton, uh, mutton product or mutton exports there, it does show the diversity in where we're sending product. And it recognises that the consumer, if it's not an established market, there is a consumer in these emerging ones that are continually developing, learning, um, understanding how to consume and enjoy our product. And I think that's a really important important thing to to note is that the diversity of the markets we send send our our sheep meat to. Yeah, that's a really good point, um, Rip. To add there, I've got a question from Angus. Do you have any thoughts on how seasons are affecting the current supply of lambs to market? Will we see larger numbers of lambs later in the seasons? Could this be a longer term trend or just given the season? So I suppose Jen covers that off in the sheep uh, sheep meat, uh, sheep producer intention survey, sort of when in the year and, and Jen will touch on what the current pulse a bit later. So I don't know, um, Rip or Jen, if you thought Rip, if you think that's a longer term trend and then Jen, what we're seeing in the, the sheep meat, um, a sheep producer intention survey. Rip, do you want to? Jen, I'll throw that one to you. <laughs> um, so we have seen um, a lot of lambs hit the seeds, um, hit the sale yards a little bit later and this this is just, um, you know, from October, we saw, uh, you know, people wanting to increase their flocks. So joining, joining happening. And as these lambs hit, hit the market, we have seen, um, you know, them, them come to the sale yards. In terms of, you know, the supply and how the season, you know, affects, uh, affects this, um, we will see uh, a larger number of lambs later in the season, and this is just due to the large supply that we have. So, um, you know, we have new season lambs from this from this season just gone. Huge drops come from the last joining, and then we also have um, older season lambs that have come from previous drops that are, are now coming to weigh and hitting the market. 
Um, in terms of long-term trends, I think um, it really depends on how the seasonal conditions, um, you know, moving forward um, pan out. And it really depends on how um, how much feed is on ground and how we support these lambs that are coming to weight, um, you know, and how quickly they can gain weight. And the piece I would maybe add is we definitely saw in 2020 um, when when we had the closure, 2021, the closure of the abattoirs in Victoria, not closure, sorry, the um, restrictions on, on capacity, that meant that a lot of Victorian lambs got held over into 2022. Um, we cleared that. That's why we had such strong uh, slaughter and production levels in 2022 because of those restrictions on the plants in 2021. And then there has been weather conditions in 2020 two that has meant that they've held them over uh, this year into 2023 because of some weather and conditions there. Um, is it longer term? Rip, you're, you might be able to close this question out with any further insights, but but they have been two things, weather last year and then the restrictions on plants was the year before, definitely why we saw some of those um, lambs held over. Yeah, I think to support Jenny and Steve, we don't expect it to be a longer term trend. Seasonal conditions and how wet last year was, particularly through winter and then, you know, into that peak growing period for most producers coming into the warmer months, you know, spring, it just poured, you know, like there was so much rain around wet weather, you know, it really did affect that finished or the ability of producers to finish finish lambs. And what that meant was, yes, they've been held back and that data that we received from the sheep producer intention survey, which Jenny runs, underpinned what we're expecting to occur this year, which mirrored last year, and the, and the wet weather did did do that. So as um, as we said, 10.1 million lambs expected to uh, to be marketed between now and June, and once seasonal conditions you know revert to normality over the longer term, we don't expect that to continue. With with that period, you know in um, in spring, when when we're typically expecting clear days and warm weather, you know, good soil temperatures, etc., allowing that weight gain, we expect producers to uh, when they're ready. It was just seasonal conditions didn't didn't allow for that to happen. Thanks, for that Rip uh, uh, and and Rip and Jen and, and team at Fed answering that. I think but, but that's a, might have answered your question, Angus. Um, Peter has a question, and this might be. For Tim, um, I hear there's a lot of beef in the world at the moment coming to market from North and South America due to droughts. Is this true? Um, thanks, thanks, Stephen, and uh, thanks, Peter. And this is a great opportunity to do a bit of cross promotion because um, we talk about this in the cattle projections, which were released a few weeks ago, um, and go into quite a bit of detail there. So if you're curious about it, you can go and have a look at the cattle projections. We talk about it, but the short answer is that there already is quite a lot of beef. Uh, floating around the world from North and South America. Um, in North America, in the United States, that is driven by drought. There's been a very, very large um, sell-off and very, very high production and historically high export volumes. Um, so North American beef has been, you know, more prominent in the international market than it's been in many years. Um, and that's largely driven by drought. In South America, there's a little bit of that dynamic. Um, but a lot of what we can think of is that South America always produces a lot of beef, but it also has a very high population. Its domestic consumption rate is normally quite high. Um, and as uh, the kind of global dynamic shifted a little bit and there are more people that are able to afford to participate in, you know, buy imported meat, um, that's increased the purchasing power of consumers, particularly in China, relative to uh, some consumers in South America. So there is a lot of beef coming out of North and South America at the moment. In North America, it's definitely due to drought. In South America, um, it seems to in large part be due to changes in relative consumer spending, um, which has meant that uh, demand has dropped, which has meant that domestic consumption has dropped. Um, but those two things, particularly the North American uh, drought dynamic, is likely to finish up soon um, because as the weather cycle turns, um, we're likely to see an end to the drought in North America, which will mean that they'll go into a big uh, retention phase and swing back to being a net importer of beef. Thanks for that, Tim. Um, so that's that's very thorough. And as you said, we we did cover this on on the um, in the cattle projections. 
So the next question is probably for, for Greg. Um, the price of sheep in lambs in WA in 2022-2023 was well down on the previous two seasons. The ability to get slaughter slot at times was challenging. The growth in lamb production in 2023 on may well challenge price and slaughter capacity. That said, hopefully we get over COVID and the ability to bring slaughter to, to uh, labour to Australia. I suppose there is a few things on that. I might answer some of that and then throw to you, Rip. Um, we do know from Home Affairs Migration Planning, uh, and we also covered this in the in the document, but also um, in the document and also in the beef projections, is that there is a look at um, bringing in skilled migration into regional Australia, and it's up significantly. It's up um, on pre-COVID levels and the last two years. So there is definitely government programs looking at bringing in skilled labour into Australia and into regional areas, which will help that processing capacity. But RIP did touch on it, and I know WA it was a bit unique, but we did definitely saw um, the sheep processing uh, sector able to deal with the increase in supply in 2022 compared to what we saw definitely in, in the cattle space. Um, in terms of dealing with labour. Um, and, and then from a price perspective, I think the key points there is prices definitely ease, but they're still at high levels on a historical basis. So when we look at a historical level basis, that they're, they're still elevated on that historical piece. They're, they're, Rip, you might want to answer on the forecast and why we didn't do forecast in this projections release and then, then what that sort of looks like going forward with the new indicators. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And I think um, just just to to touch on that, Greg, we are making changes to our suite of sheep and lamb indicators. Um, we're adjusting the specifications. So the reason we didn't ask and provide, or we didn't ask our six industry analysts, um, MLA doesn't forecast price, but we are six industry analysts, really respected ones for, for a price forecast for the National Trade RAM indicator. We didn't ask them because we're making these changes and they're impending. So we didn't feel it was necessary. If we're going to go and change the specs, um, you are basically be forecasting a price that wasn't relevant once we change the indicator. So there's a reason for not doing that, but we do expect to reinstate the price forecast for the lamb indicator moving forwards um, in, in into the July projections as well. So the expectation is once we've made these changes to then restart that that price forecasting and request that information from, from those analysts in industry. And, and Rip, you guys have done a great job consulting with the Peak Industry Councils and you had surveys out to producers that were well, um, for all industry participants on, on the indicators and just opening specs to include weights and, and the likes. Um, and sale prefixes. So you've done a great job uh, with those uh, indicator reviews. Uh, that draws us to the end of question time. And I know there are a few still in the, um, there, there are still some sitting unanswered, but we will definitely get back, ensure that we respond to your questions quickly in, in a prompt manner. Um, so what I wanted to give Jen an opportunity now is just to highlight the current wave of the sheep projections uh, intention survey. Like we, we've quoted up quite a lot, it, it's a very valuable uh, industry resource that gets producer um, intentions and sale numbers uh, reported, which is very important um, giving us a source of, of truth of what we expect the, the sale of, of lambs and, and sheep to do in the next few months. So Jen, over to you. So um, I'm sure many of you are aware, but we actually uh, changed the sheep projection um, surveys um, and we went with a new provider. And we think that the new the new format really gives us a, a better insight into what's happening at the farm gate level and and um, what's happening in the industry. Um, we, we changed some of the questions that we asked, how we asked them, um, and, and we had a much better response rate to our survey than we have previously. So the way that it, um, it runs is in February, which is happening right now, um, we have a pulse survey and that is um, people who opted in, um, who answered the October wave um, could opt in for the pulse survey. It's a two to five minute um, basically check in on the numbers that were that were answered in October. Um, if you do have that, uh, it's come through email and text. I really um, encourage you to fill that out. It's really important for industry and to inform you know, other projects like the, um, the sheep projections. So then in April, we'll do another full survey um, and this is for joining. 
um, just to check in how many, uh, you know, use you're joining um, and what your expectations are for the outlook um, for the rest of the year. Um, again, I really um, stress that um, it's it's great for industry if you fill these out. Um, I encourage you to fill it out. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me um, or, or Rip or anyone in the team and, and we'll help you um, answering these um, questions. Um, I know surveys are irritating and um, can take up a lot of your time and, and time that you probably can, can do other things with, but um, it's really important for you guys to fill these out. It's, it's supporting your own industry and giving you insights um, for better decision making. Um, when October rolls around, we'll do another full survey and this is just to check your marking rates um, and, and confirm your joining rates. So um, again, I can't stress enough, we really appreciate your time when you fill out these surveys. Um, I know it can seem that uh, you're not getting, you know, anything out of it, but we've revamped the survey and you get an actual personalised report card now from those full waves and that just benchmarks you against other um, other averages in your in your region and in your area. So I really recommend um, filling them out. And again, if you have any questions, my um, contact details were in the slide before and um, just reach out and I'm happy to help you anytime. Thanks for that, Jen. So that draws the sheet projections presented by the marketing information team to a close. Thanks for everyone's time today and, and Jen and Tim and Rip for, for their presentations. Um, there is a uh, survey link in the Q&A tab and we ask that you do feed, fill that out. So it just allows us to continually improve our offerings of these webinars and the products that we uh, offer as a team to meet your needs, like we said at the start. So please do take that time to fill out that survey that is in there. Um, for the questions that haven't been answered, we will get a response to you. Um, and so, and also a recording will be made available to, it's on the website, but also uh, the, the slide deck and the recording will be made available to those participants of the webinar today on, on request. So that is a wrap from our end. We really appreciate your time today and um, giving us your full hour and being engaged and asking a lot of questions. And like we reiterated a few times today, um, don't hesitate to reach out to the team. Contact details have been provided for any supply, pricing or production uh, insights. So thank you everyone for your time today and have a great day. Bye.